Okay. Um, I think if anyone uh, else comes into the waiting room, they will be let in. It's time to begin our program. And uh, I do want to welcome everybody. And because this program is being offered in English and Spanish with simultaneous interpretation, the first order of business is to introduce our translator, Luis Lopez, and he will share interpretation instructions with everybody. Luis. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes, bienvenidas. Eh, estamos interpretando del inglés al español. El programa será en inglés hoy. Así que para conectar en español eh, su interpretación, en un momento cuando yo termine de presentarlo, aparecerá un globito en los iconos de abajo de su pantalla. Y pueden seleccionar en el globo, elegir español y, o Spanish, porque aparecerá en inglés. Y ahí... Eh, ya me deberán escuchar a mí cuando estén hablando los panelistas en inglés. De acuerdo, muchas gracias y seguimos adelante. También puse las instrucciones en el chat por si lo necesitan. Gracias. Gracias, Luis. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll uh, very, very pleased to see you all here today. And I also want to point out that closed captioning is available in English. And uh, you can access that by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen. Your microphones have been muted upon entry. Uh, the, your video is, uh, is actually um, also turned off, I believe. Uh, and we would prefer that uh, to minimize distraction for our speakers. Um, the panelists will be happy to take your comments and questions following their conversation. So please type them in the chat during the course of the program and they will be addressed at the end. Um, before I start, I really want to thank uh, our moderator, our panelists, and my museum colleagues who are here today. Masha Cherchinsky, our director and CEO, and Olivia Cipriano, who uh, is our programs manager and she is facilitating behind the scenes. So welcome to our virtual panel discussion, Living Language and Identity. How do we talk about ourselves? Do we prefer to identify ourselves according to our country of origin or heritage or use commonly accepted terms like Hispanic, Chicano, Chicana? Latino, Latina, or Latin X. No matter which term is used, people are rarely in full agreement. It's an emotionally charged topic and there are important usage variations depending on factors such as region, language, generation, and political inclination. So today we are joining uh, Jose Higuera Lopez, director of the Mexican Studies Institute at the City of New York, Lehman College, who is moderating this panel with Professor Gabriela Baeza Ventura, Associate Professor of Spanish at the University of Houston, Professor Larry Lafont Stokes, Professor of Spanish and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Michigan, and Uni Villalonga, Chief Curator at the Carl Gables Museum to help us understand the origins and meanings of these terms and the complex ways in which they are used. This program, has been inspired by our current exhibition, Border Cantos, Sonic Border, Richard Mizrach, Guillermo Galindo, which is on view at the Hudson River Museum through May 9th of this year through the generous support of Art Bridges. And this program itself was developed in collaboration with the Mexican Studies Institute at the City University of New York, Lehman College, and the Lehman College Art Gallery, and is brought to us today through the generous support of Art Bridges. So I am now going to introduce our moderator, Jose Higuera Lopez, who will in turn uh, take over the program and introduce our distinguished panelists. Jose Higuera Lopez is the Deputy Director of the Mexican Studies Institute at the City University of New York, serving as Academic and Administrative Director since December 2016. He was born in Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico, and immigrated to the US in 2009. 
Under his leadership at the Institute, agreements have been signed to promote student and teaching mobility between CUNY's Lehman College and eight public universities in Mexico. Iguera also founded the Digital Archives and Resources Unit, as well as the Mexican Studies Archives and Library, which aim to preserve the historical memory of the Mexican community in New York. Since 2016, he has coordinated the teaching of indigenous languages between Mexican instructors and the Indigenous Language Consortium established between NYU, Columbia University, and the CUNY Mexican Studies Institute in order to promote and revitalize the indigenous languages in transnational communities. And in 2019, he founded the New York City International Book Fair, whose mission is to disseminate academic and literary work published in Spanish in Latin America, the Caribbean, Spain, and the United States. And now I turn the program over to our moderator, Jose. Thank you so much, Sarah Linda, for this wonderful introduction. I wanna thank everyone that is joining us uh, for this virtual panel discussion. I will do my best to guide this conversation so we can have a basic understanding of some of the terms being used today according to our country of origin, as Sarlinda was saying. Um, as you have already read in the description and Sarlinda was so grateful to remind us, this topic has multiple layers. But before we start our conversation, I wanna take this time to welcome our panelists, uh, Dr. Gabriela Baez Aventura, a native from the border, Mexico, US, is Associate Professor of Spanish with specialization on US Latino literature in the Department of Hispanic Studies at the University of Houston. Dr. Baeza Ventura is Executive Editor at Arte Publico Press, the premier US Latino publishing house in the United States, where she is responsible for editing and production of up to 30 books a year. Moreover, she is co-founder of the Andrew W. Mellon founded US Latino Digital Humanities Program that provides training and research opportunities to community members, students, and scholars. Dr. Baez Aventura has published on various aspects of Latino literature, including women, immigration, recovery works, language, and young adult and children literary productions. Her publications include the monograph La Imagen de la Mujer en las Crónicas del México de Afuera, two anthologies on Latino, US Latino Literatura uh, con Otra Mirada, Cuentos Hispanos, de los Estados Unidos and U.S. Latino Literature Today, Anthology of Contemporary Latino Literature, in addition of the collected works of Chicana renowned poet An An Angela de Hoyos, and has edited and introduced three collections on Central American literature recovering the U.S. Hispanic literary essays and U.S. Latino journals. Welcome, Gabriela. Loris, <laughs> Lawrence Lafontaine Stokes, uh, as professor of American culture, Romans languages and literatures, and women's studies, women's and gender studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and received a B his BA from Harvard University and his MA and PhD from Columbia University. He is author of Queer Queer Ricans, Culture and Sexuality in the Diaspora, and of several books of fiction. His book, Translocas, the Politics of Puerto Rican Drag and Trans Performance is part of the Triangulation Lesbian Gay Queer Theater Drama Performance Series. Larry performs in drag as Lola Bon Miramar since 2010, and it has appeared on, in several episodes on the YouTube series Cooking with Drag Queens. Welcome, Larry. Yunekis Villalonga graduated from art history at the University of Havana, Cuba, and went to serve as curator at the Ludwig uh, Foundation of Cuba, Cuba for four years. During this time, she was also teaching contemporary Caribbean art at the Institute, Instituto Superior de Arte in Havana. In 2004, she won the National Curatorship Award for the National Union of Writers and Artists of Cuba. As visual art projects manager at the British Council of Cuba, she organized several international exhibitions in Cuba and in the UK. Uh, her goal was inserting Caribbean and Cuban art into a broader international scene. In 2010, she immigrated to the US and a year later, she joined Lehman College Art Gallery at the City University of New York, where she worked as curator and was also involved in their broad arts education program. In 2016, she relocated to Miami, Florida, where she joined the Bakehouse Art Complex as Associate Director of Exhibitions and Education. 
Since 2018, she has been the chief curator at the Coral Gables Museum in Florida. Welcome, Uni. Okay, so let's start our conversation. Uh, can we start by talking about the different terms mostly uh, or most commonly used? Uh, we already mentioned Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Chicano, Chicana, Latinx, and BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color in general, so we can have a better understanding of the terms. And Gabriela, can you start with this one? Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks uh, thank you to everyone for being here today. Um, yeah, so all of these terms I want to I want to um, mention, of course, that the we, you know the the term you know we start off with the term Hispanic uh, as as a term that is used to identify or group together all the people, all the complexities, right, of the different uh, Spanish speaking communities who are who are uh, living and participating in the United States, and so. Hispanic is a term that is imposed on the community, you know, to, um, in in the in the in the sixties and seventies, right? Latino is a term that already existed before as a term to uh, reference people of La uh, from Latin America, but Hispanic is a term that is chosen uh, by uh, governmental agencies in the seventies to try to group the communities together to try to figure out a way to just identify like everybody, right? Because we were so complex up until, well, we are very complex. Up until this moment, many um, uh, people from uh, different uh, uh, Hispanic speaking, from Spanish speaking uh, communities uh, were identifying uh, regionally, right? For example, like I myself identify as a fronteriza or as a border dweller, as a Chicana, as a Mexican American, as a Mexican. And so, the it, it it was very hard for administration for you know national uh, decisions to be made on behalf of the, this community that was that is so complex and it was difficult to to try to um, to figure out like how, what to call them right and so I think uh, we start with the term Hispanic uh, Latino is existent uh, and and it seems that for a, for a while that the term Hispanic seems to be the term that is uh, the best because it encompasses um, all the Spanish-speaking com uh, communities in the United States. However, uh, the communities, uh, our, our Latino community, it, it has always been a community that is uh, very outspoken, that uh, is always uh, looking to uh, participate in uh, political, uh, politically, uh, uh, economically, socially, et cetera. We're very active in our community. And so we start to question, why is it that this term that has deep roots with colonial impositions, right? Has been, why has it been chosen for us? Why have we not been part of that conversation, right? And, and why is it imposed on us? And so the alternative to Hispanic be, then for a while becomes Latino. Uh, and then, in, uh, then Latino and, and Hispano also began to be questioned when we start to, uh, to, um, to question the uh, issues of gender, right? Hispano only references to one specific section of the community, right? So then Hispanas, right? It, it begins to be incorporated. Then we evolve into the, into the arroba, the, the, um, the arroba. Yeah, yeah, right. And so we, then we move from that into, now we move from that into uh, Latin X, right? Adding the X to try to be, to incorporate all of the, you know, the different variations of, you know, of life that, it, that, that this um, identity represents. And so, that's a very convoluted history or, or walk through, through, through all of these terminology. And I think we, we, one thing that I wanna make clear is that this is a term that begins, uh, that begins to be used in the 60s. Uh, we're living in 2020 and, in the, and by the 2020s, we've already gone through like five different terms that we're trying to grapple with. And that is why like from my perspective as an editor, right? I, I mean, as, as an editor, we're constantly struggling to see what is the term that needs to be used when we when when our writers are, are are writing their works when we edit their work when we're marketing their work as a as i work with a nonprofit organization who relies heavily on funding from foundations who a lot of times impose terminology on us so some foundations want us to use a latinx right and they, and they have specific grants for latinx they don't want funds for they don't want to fund anything that is latino or latina right they want latinx and so then we have to manipulate those things, but you know these are things that we're constantly working with. And I think I want to I want to 
keep remember, uh, hopefully remind people that this is something that is evolving, that is an identity, that is that it is an identity that that for example, I myself, Gab Gabriela, can be Latina, Chicana, Mexican American, Mexican fronteriza, right? Latin X, Latina, or Latino, but it also you know, I can, I can define those things for myself, but unfortunately, there are people above me and my administrator, my the president at my university, my supervisors, my next door neighbor who can, you know, identify me mm -hmm. in a very, in whichever way they, they feel. And so I think it's also, it comes from us, hopefully, hopefully this, this discussion will generate a little bit of education or questioning about why is it that somebody chooses to call themselves a certain name and what is the history behind that? And if I understand that there's that there's that option and that that person can be all of those things and it is their choice, I should be okay with that. Exactly, thank you, Gabriela. Larry, do you want to jump in? Sure, um, thank you, Jose. Um, well, first, um, let me thank the Hudson River Museum. It is really exciting to be with all of you talking about this very important topic. I agree with a lot of the things that Gabriela has said. I think the first thing is to recognize that language is alive, language evolves and language changes. And, and this is good. Um, this is good because it means that language can respond. We can transform language to acknowledge the changes that we are implementing in society. But it is also a challenge in, in the sense that it means that we have to be open to constantly acknowledging and constantly understanding that people use different words in different ways. Sometimes it's even the same word, um, a word like Hispanic or a word like Latino or Latinx might have different meanings for different people. So one good strategy is simply to ask a person, why do you use this term? And what does this term mean to you? Not to take for granted that we all share the same definition of words. So I am from Puerto Rico. So if you ask me, I am going to tell you, yo soy Puerto Ricoño. I am Puerto Rican. And if I am in drag, I am going to say I am Puerto Ricoña because Spanish is a language that marks gender. So when, you, when you're self-describing, it marks your gender. And this, this is a challenge, which is why in Spanish, for example, some people have introduced the E, the vowel E, so instead of having to say Latino or Latina, you can say Latine. And in the United States, we're seeing the same thing with the introduction of the X. So the X somehow tries to go beyond that challenge of having to identify either as masculine or feminine. But we are talking about um, prof profound issues that have to do with social struggles such as feminism and gay liberation not everybody is knowledgeable about these struggles. Not everybody is interested in them and not everybody agrees with them. So when I self-identify, I will self-identify as Puerto Rican. I self-identify as queer. I self-identify as Latin American and Caribbean. And in the United States, I'm very interested in using pan-ethnic terms that are coalitional terms that envision, in fact, the reality that Jose Martí um, and other Latin American intellectuals have highlighted for over a hundred years, which has to do with the commonalities between different Spanish, Portuguese, French, Creole language speaking countries in Latin America. The fact that I do have things in common with Mexicans and Cubans and Brazilians and Argentinians. So sometimes it is to my advantage where it just really reflects who I am to say that I am Latin American. And in the United States, the terms, the terms that serve to do that, Hispanic, which has fallen out of favor, but Latinos did participate in those conversations in the 1970s with the US government. It was Latinos who chose the word Hispanic. The word Hispanic has been rejected by some people. They see it as being too closely linked to Spain, to Hispania, which is why Latina, Latino, and Latinx um, have more popularity. But I think it is a mistake to adopt Latinx without understanding, number one, that not everybody knows what you are talking about. Number two, 
that it is a term that has politics. I am particularly fond of Alan Pelaez Lopez's article, the X in Latin X is a wound, not a trend. And for Alan Pelaez Lopez, he says, if you're going to use the word Latin X, it's crucial that you understand that this is a term that is anti-racist. It is a term that acknowledges transgender experience. If you are using Latin X because it's a fad without understanding its history, it makes no sense. Well, then you might as well use Latino or Latina or Hispanic. Latin X is a radical term. Um, when I teach um, this essay at the University of Michigan, sometimes students uh, get upset or they feel it is too political. At the same time, students are at the vanguard. It is precisely teenagers and young adults in the United States of Latin American and Caribbean descent who are using Latin X the same way that it is feminists and queers and LGBT people in Argentina and in other countries in Latin America who are proposing the use of E to get beyond sexist language. So my sense is be open to the multiplicity of terms ask people what terms they use to self-identify and try to respect. We all have the right to choose the words that we feel that really represent us. Thank you. Uh, Uni, do you wanna share something about this uh, around the different terminology? Uh, I just remind her to open your mic, but yes. There we go. So, thank you so much, Will. First of all, to you, to uh, the museum, Masha Saralinda, for this invitation. It is an honor to me uh, for me to be here. And um, well, I'm, although I'm not an expert in the term and in language, um, I wanted to follow up on on Larry's. Uh, um, presentation and I wanted to start with my own example. I come from Havana. I was, um, I studied in Havana my first years, years uh, working as a curator was, uh, happened in Cuba and in that context there is almost no conversation or there wasn't at that time on racial and gender issues. Uh, it was very scarce because um, it was impossible to publicly acknowledge that long history of racism and xenophobia um, in the country. The revolution had sort of um, eradicated those problems to have. And um, that affected and was reflected in, in the art that was being made basically because um, it could not be discussed in the spaces that had visibility. So um, with this, I wanted to make the observation that, well, for first of all, for me coming to this country and realizing um, this celebration of the difference and of identities uh, was a great find and, and, and a learning experience that I have, of course, implemented in my work. Um, but I do realize that um, depending on the context where many of the artists that I work with, uh, with that live now here are settled in, in the States, but depending on the context uh, from where they come, they could be more or less aware on these issues and and of their of, of the identity you know issues and and statement that they uh, compel in their work. So um, now I find that not all the time, especially because I work with group exhibitions under you know around themes. Sometimes identity um, is not the way in which through which they want to present their work and it's always a challenge to have this balance you know to try and represent all sorts of identities but also to try and represent the statements and and the you know the different voices on certain themes the the, the that the artists have so yes thank you thank you yes and i think it's it's true right uh we all have traces of national and cult or cultural pride also on top of the identity. Uh, personally, I identify as Mexican and as a proud Tijuanense. And it was until I came here to New York City that I really started to hear the term Spanish, uh, but not from Spain. Like they would say, oh, are you Spanish? I was like, no, I'm Mexican. 
but they were using it as an interchangeable, interchangeable, interchangeable label that encompassed Mexican, Latino, Hispanic, anything, right? But it was here in New York City that I, 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 I first was exposed to this term uh, as Spanish. And also I started to feel a part of a larger community, Latino, Latinx, once you start to get really involved in all the equity and, and, and racial and, and also gender um, uh, just fights that our communities of, of color and also our, our, our trans community is, is facing here and the, 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 uh, the sense of activism, I think it's, it's great. So I think it's a great segue to ask you personally, I know that you have mentioned a little bit about how you identify, but can you share with us how do you personally identify and do you feel that the term Latinx reflects a complete representation or, uh, uh, of your identity? Um, Larry, you wanna take this one? Um, sure. Um, well, La Latinx is a very new term. Well, technically it's over 10 years old, um, but for me, it is still a very new term because I am much more used to Latino and Latina. Um, so, so I still find it challenging. I forget. It doesn't roll off my tongue the way that it rolls off the tongue of, of some of my students who, in fact, I would say it is my students who have gotten me to, to try to make an effort. Uh, it, 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 it takes work to learn new terms because as I said, I mean, well, language is changing. I'm Puerto Rican. I find it easier to say that I am Puerto Rican. I think being Puerto Rican reflects who I am, but I understand the need and the desire for coalitional terms and for pan-ethnic terms, because there are people who are not just one thing. There are people who are Mexican or who are Colombian Panamanian or who are Guatemalan Dominican. And sometimes Latino, Latina or Latinx is just much easier than having to explain. Oh, not to mention that sometimes people don't even know where your country is, or they think your country is part of another country, because that's part of the challenge. The level of ignorance in the United States, the lack of awareness of the specificity of the more than 17 countries in Latin America that speak Spanish. The fact that Puerto Ricans were very similar to Dominicans, they were not the same thing. And sometimes you want to explain that you have the patience, the enthusiasm, the political desire, but other days you feel lazy uh, because it's like, why should we have to be explaining all the time? So I, uh, I embrace the term Latinx, but I, I think I'm also fine with Latina and Latino. Uh, uh, the term Hispanic and Hispano does not generate in me a visceral reaction. Uh, because may maybe because I'm also always thinking in English and in Spanish. So I'm thinking of myself as Latino Americano. I'm thinking of myself as Puerto Ricano. I'm thinking of myself as Latino. And then, and then sometimes it's funny because in Latin America, in Puerto Rico, in the Caribbean, sometimes people reject those terms without understanding the, the, the diaspora the experience of people in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, in Australia, in Italy, in other countries is valid and important. And that we have to try to understand that it's not the same thing to be Puerto Rican in the Caribbean that it is to be Puerto Rican in the United States. And, and that in that context, Latin X does important work. It does important work. So I advocate for the multiplicity of terms and, but also for asking people, what is the term that you like to use? Great. Uh, Gabriela, you want to jump in? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, I absolutely second um, everything that Larry said. And I think I would add, like for myself, I, st I am still very anchored in the feminist and especially the uh, third world uh, feminist movements that struggled, you know, and fought so much to incorporate the gender recognition. And so for me, it's still a little bit difficult to identify as, as a Latin ex uh, myself, just because I feel that um, it's a little too early for me to, uh, to erase the, 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 the A from the Latina or from the Hispana. Um, but I, I absolutely embrace, you know, in my students and my community 
And, you know, in the public work that we do, the marketing, you know, if it, if it calls for, um, for a, 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 collect, a term that, that, that identifies the collectivity and the multiplicity, the diversity, the, and, and most importantly, the various, the various political issues that our communities are faced, um, something, you know, we continue to ask, to, to invite people to ask us, right? How do we want to, you know, what is the term that we want to use? But sometimes that ask comes from a very, uh, from not a sensitive place, right? So where are you from? What, what do you call yourself and why? You know, and so we are a lot of times we're burdened with explaining to people, you know, where we live, you know, where is Mexico? Oh, I'm from Ciudad Juarez. Oh, that's where all the killings are going on. Are you okay? You don't live there anymore because you're afraid to live there. No, you know, of course course not you know it's you know and so we have to do a lot of you know re reliving some of those those traumas and then also um we are, as a mexican as a mexican american who has uh, endured a lot of discrimination and prejudice you know through the various uh, infrastructures you know within the united states a lot of times we're also not allowed to question the terms that are imposed on us right so for example i mentioned it earlier about when we apply for grants and when, you know, and when we uh, argue to perhaps maybe not use Latinx, because that means, for example, you know, all our books at Arte Publico have been using, for, you know, in, in the 80s, we were, we, we used the term Hispano, right, uh, or Hispanic, right? And so we get a lot of criticism now for, with people that, you know, say, oh, you guys are vendidos, you know, you need to be using Latinx, you know, get with the times. Well, we have 600 books already printed that are you know that are part of our archive so when we change that it's you know it's also like in terms of practical uh, practicality right? like are we going to go back and change that or or are we going to you know come into an understanding that people have the right to use you know these these various terms um but so so i hope that answer i hope that answers the question I, I'll, I'll leave it at that definitely thank you so much and and uni you can of course uh, after answering this question, would you also share with us specifically challenges and experiences uh, or more challenges and experiences that you had as a, as a curator when putting together the different exhibitions as artists and how do you work with artists to honor their personal identification? Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I identify myself as a woman, as, um, as a Cuban, as a Cuban America, can, as a Latino, uh, Latina, uh, as a Hispanic, um, I do not use so much the term Latinx, although I'm, I totally um, agree and, and connect to what it stands for. And, uh, but I do think, you know, I find it tricky sometimes um, when it comes to being specific, right? And um, it is not the same to be um, a person born here to, you know, Uruguayan parents than to be a person that arrived 10 years ago from Cuba or, 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 or you know, the Dominican Republic. Um, this being said, I think um, the possibility to use the term um, for grants and funding and, 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 you know, use it in the context of the politics of representation is wonderful. And uh, if not Latinx tomorrow, it's going to be a different term that um, that I would be willing to embrace for those purposes. I just um, I am concerned of erasing the differences sometimes, and it applies specifically to my work, to what I do exhibitions. So I'm I'm always very careful, as Larry was saying, to ask um, how do you want to be identified and is your identity important in which you want you know in relationship to what you want to say in your with your work because we can fall very easily in, in labels labeling and stereotyping and that is always something that i that i want to avoid so um i think the term is not the problem um uh, it could be any term as long as it reflects um our beliefs and, and, and you know, are willing to accept the difference and the dif multiplicity and celebrate the, the different identities. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very rarely call myself Latinx. I'm not used to the term. I think it's a more generational thing as well. 
um, but I do use um, Latino, Hispanic, Cuban, Cuban American. So, and well, in this regard, and going to your question, Jose, um, I wanted to to mention, for example, a, a specific example. Um, the exhibition that we have at the moment is called Alien Nations 2020. And it was curated with my dear colleague, Bartolome Bland at Lehman, the director of Lehman College Art Gallery. Uh, it is a second edition um, of that exhibition. We called it Alien Nations at Lehman in 2017. And then we brought it to Miami because we thought it, the term was so, I mean, the concept was so current, you know, there's so much alienation in different terms uh, going on. And uh, we wanted to talk about individual, social, political, cultural alienation, alienation from the institution of art. And um, it's been very interesting trying to, to represent going back to the identity, represent uh, all sorts of identities and possibilities within this topic. But I feel a very important part also um, is the related programming. You know, whatever we cannot achieve when it comes to representation uh, with the works, we can always um, achieve it by interviewing the artists, by creating panel discussions. And this is also a, a very important part of the work. So we did have, we are going to have on March 10, a panel that will be moderated by um, Lilian Dominguez, our director of education and me, um, that is specifically um, on, with Latinx artists. But at the same time, we, Bart and I created a series of video interviews that are online, um, they're not physical, that, are, that is called The Nation I Inhabit. And I find it very important too, because we're not catered into a specific group, but we are, you know, choosing a variety of artists and talking with them about the worlds they live in which I think is very important. And, and uh, you know, well, that, that's a specific project that I wanted to, to talk about in this regard. That's great. Thank you, Yuni. But if, yes, if, go ahead. if I can jump in. So yes. um, listening to Juni, uh, what I'm thinking about is intersectionality and how we, we are multiple things at the same time. And sometimes in some context, our racial or ethnic identity might not be the most salient one. In some contexts, literally, my most salient identity might be that I am an artist or a professor or queer. Uh, it might not be, but in others, it, it might be. And that, I don't, that might be a function of white privilege, but it might not be. It literally might have to be a question of solidarity with people who have the same interests, the same desires. So to acknowledge that these ethnic categories, they're, they're not a prison. They, they, they are not something meant to tie you down. They, they, they are a space of, of possibility, of communion, but, but also of reinvention. That's what I would say. Yes, and this is a great segue to my next question. Uh, we are seeing more support and in the use of preferred gender pronouns in email signatures and also like us here on, on, on Zoom calls. Can you talk about the importance of expressing diversity and gender identity through these types of practices? And also uh, what other types of practices can we support to be more inclusive? Uh, and I'll ask Larry to jump in first. Um, sure. So uh, earlier I said how it, it was, it took me a while to learn and start to use Latin X. And I'm going to say the same thing about acknowledging pronouns in English and in Spanish because we, we grow up um, in a context in which all of these, uh, well, gender is taken for granted and it is naturalized. So it is simply assumed that you see a person with a masculine self-presentation or who looks masculine to us and we're going to use the masculine pronoun, él, uh, he. And remember in Spanish, every single word becomes gendered. So it's not just about the pronoun, it's about every single adjective or every single noun that is gendered. Um, so my experience is dealing with young people who were, who were um, transgender, um, who were challenging gender binary norms, was that it was crucial 
to allow people to self-identify and to, to tell you so that we do not assume that we know. So, so I embrace, um, it is still uh, challenging for me. Sometimes I still have to remember that I should say he, him, his. Uh, it, it's, it's, sometimes I want to joke because sometimes it's, it's really not he, him because I perform in drag. And when I perform as Lola Bon Miramar, um, I use the feminine because I'm a drag queen. Um, but so, so I, I don't want to make a joke, but sometimes it can be funny. Sometimes it can be absurd. Um, sometimes it can be challenging because people have introduced gender neutral pronouns. So for example, they, so getting used to using they and then overcoming people's resistance. Some people think it's ungrammatical. Other people can very clearly explain the historical development of the pronoun they in the English language. So it's, it's not ungrammatical at all. It is a choice. So I find it quite fascinating. And in Spanish, people are using EJ, using the E instead of the, the A or the O. So there's a lot of linguistic innovation. Linguistic innovation can be challenging, but it is also exciting. Yes, thank you. Uh, Gabriela, can you share with us? This sure, absolutely. Um, I, I, I agree like, uh, the, with, with a lot of the things that Larry said. Um, and I think it's, it's, um, it's, it is so challenging, especially, you know, as, as we get older and we've been formed in a, you know, in a very specific way about, you know, how to speak our, our language. And, and, it, and the, the, the great thing is that I feel that the new generation very, uh, at least it's been in my experience that the newer generations are very generous with us and they've, and they've been patient and, and, and are encouraging us to, you know, to walk, walk through some of these mistakes because uh, newer generations are not having a problem with this. They're seeing the gender fluidity. They're seeing uh, all the fluidity and language, and they're okay with it. Uh, it is, you know, from the uh, us who have gone through like this very formal education through the universities, through our schools, through all those those systems that that put in place the binaries in such a very strong way that uh, you know that have a hard time with it. Uh, but, uh, in, you know, I'm very lucky to work in a field that is, you know, in the arts. And so I, I have the opportunity to uh, have, you know, a role as an, you know, as somebody who can influence that from my, from my role as an editor, uh, working in digital humanities in these virtual spaces as a professor at a university. Uh, but I, I, but my role is also uh, invigorated because I am also in touch with a lot of uh, younger community. And in a in a community who is very open and 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 multiple, right, and very diverse, um, but there but there there are definitely many challenges. And maybe the last thing that I want to say is that if we make this uh, highly visible, right, if we make it a practice a practice of always using the pronouns, you know, uh, uh, next to our name, so that people get used to seeing that, you know, uh, maybe I want to be I I want to use the pronoun she for myself, but. I, or I want to use he, but I want to keep my name, my name as Gabriela. And I know that, you know, eventually people have a hard time if they need to refer to me as he, but, you know, say Gabriela, he wants this, etc. Right. So I know that that'll be hard, but, you know, um, I think the fact that we're visualizing that the same thing that is happening with identities in the past, it was very easy to only see, uh, uh, you know, uh, Spanish or Mexican or Cuban or Puerto Rican, but now we're seeing all the mixed com mixed uh, communities, and 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 that's being accepted. You know, like the Mexican, uh, you know, um, and and we're 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 being exposed to them, and so it's easier for us to see that as part of our daily life and not have to refer to the Spanish. You know, to for somebody to t to ask you if you're Spanish because they're afraid that you'll be offended if they ask you if you're Mexican. That's where I don't want to ever go back to, right? That yeah. that's that's what I, I want to avoid, and I feel like that we're we're moved a little bit beyond that because there is so much visibility of that. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, you need you want to share something? Oh. You're still on mute. Let's see. There we go. No, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I think it is important and I think um, it is still um, a, a long way to go with the use of, of um, you know, not only the pronouns, but also in terms of educating, especially older generations. I was talking to 
to Lily Dominguez, my, my colleague, who is the director of education, she was telling me uh, how she had read this, um, this study um, where the generation, generation X, um, you know, given these numbers that the generation X is, is uh, every, you know, one every six persons identify themselves as something other than heterosexual. So I think um, this is super interesting. And this is something that should go beyond just uh, um, naming, but also there is a lot of education. You know, the, the programs, the educational programs have to change. The way in which we represent um, the different communities and people um, um, in history, in the history that we are writing, uh, in what we're doing, um, has to change and part of it is educating people because people doesn't really know um, beyond the intellectual circles of how important this is. So um, I totally um, agree that this, this it, not only that it's important, but there is a long way to go in this sense. Yes, thank you, thank you. And as you all been saying and, 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 and mentioning, right, uh, language is always evolving and and one word alone can reflect different movements, priorities, power dynamics, and even political views. For example, the term uh, legal alien for a person that is a permanent resident that really reflects a sense of not fully belonging to this country, hence an alien. Uh, can you uh, reflect on how language has reflected power dynamics, political views, and the need to change certain ter terminology? And why is it important to embrace these terms? Uh, we are running out of time, so uh, but still, I want to hear your your your, your uh, opinion on this. Uh, Gabriela, let's start with you. Uh, sure, um, I'm glad you you brought that term up. Um, I think uh, just the fact that that we are able to rethink of all the of, of any terminology. I I, I like uh, one thing that that both Uni and Larry have have mentioned. Uh, I love that Uni at first uh, identified herself as a woman, uh, and then um, that Larry um, referred us to uh, intersectionalities. And so when we think of of language, you know, we always think of it as you know, we think that it that it is that it doesn't evolve, that it's that it's uh, static, and that and then we cannot resignify words, but we do it all the time, right? We do it all the time, and so unfortunately, but we we always go back to when somebody corrects us and says, "Oh, you know, that's not you're not allowed to say that," or you know, or or you're supposed to speak only in one specific way because we're so guided by binaries, and so you either you know you do you do it the right way or you you're doing it the wrong way. And so I think uh, I th just think that any term for me I think the 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 the, the most most difficult term for me has always been the one the one that has to do with le uh, legal uh, 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 you know there's a, a corrido uh, Superman uh, Superman también es ilegal right Superman is an, is our first illegal alien right he's coming into into the country illegally. Um, and, and it's important that we first uh, address that term, just like you said, that, that we began to think about different ways of, of renaming these things that are very hurtful and that we each should take every day, you know, a term that, that perhaps is, it has been hurtful to our communities and, and try to resignify it and know that we have the power to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, before I, I go to you need to, to ask her uh, input, I wanna also invite our viewers. Uh, we're, we're coming close to our Q&A section. So, Feel free to start uh, typing your questions in. Also, feel free to say where are you uh, actually uh, uh, connecting from, if you're in Mexico, if you're in Cuba, where are you from? Uh, feel free to start, and then we'll have a time to read your questions to the panelists. So, Uni, please. Uh, let me see. Hold on. Ask to mute. There we go. I don't know if Larry wanted to, to say something about this topic. My, you know, given given the time that we have left, I wanted to make a, a comment that is unrelated to this question. Um, so I'd rather have um, Larry speak first if, if you wanted to comment on this question, Larry. Definitely, and we'll have time also uh, before we take the questions for all of you to just share final thoughts. So feel free to answer this question, uh, Larry, and then we'll have also time for you to just share your final thoughts. Well, well, I was just thinking about how interesting and fascinating that process of 
resignifying or changing the meaning of words. So if you think of a word such as New Yorican, New Yorican was an insult, but then poets and artists like Miguel Algarín and Miguel Piñero decided to transform the meaning of the word New Yorican. And, and now we have diasporican and American. If you think of the way that the word queer, uh, well, for some people, queer is still a profoundly offensive word. Uh, and for other people, queer has become a, a badge of pride. And in Latin America and in Spanish, some of us are trying to transform the word and the spelling using C-U-I-R, queer. It's kind of the same, but it's, it's not. And um, so somebody, somebody in the questions is, is asking about hyphenated identities. So we haven't even mentioned the hyphen, but hyphen identities bring in yet another level of complexity. Puerto Ricans typically do not self-identify as Puerto Rican American, but other groups such as Cuban Americans, Dominican Americans, Mexican Americans do have a longer tradition of that. And sometimes there's a move against that. So, so that is a fascinating topic. Definitely, thanks. So the questions are starting to, to come in. So I, 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 and you can see some of them are being just put in into the uh, um, general chat. If you wanted to send it directly to one of the panelists, feel free or just send it to me and I'll just read it to them. Uh, so before we start taking the, the, the questions, we still have time to share some final thoughts uh, of, of um, of this topic, or also if you want to share with us anything that has to do with your research or current projects, now's the time. Uh, I'll start with, let's take Uni. Yeah, so I wanted to uh, finally uh, refer to an exhibition that is very interesting uh, regarding identity that we're working on. It's opening in April. Um, and it is um, an exhibition on the 40th anniversary of the first reported case of AIDS. We are, um, we are um, a civic arts museum, so we not only show art, but um, we show history, architecture. So this exhibition specifically is telling the history of um, artists and other people um, that contracted AIDS throughout the years, but also the science behind it and, and how the disease evolved, especially because we believe it's very timely now in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, it has been, you know, a conversation that is raised um, constantly is how um, we are going to represent the population that we're talking about, uh, especially because there was such a stigma of AIDS being um, a disease related specifically with non-binary genders, you know, and at the same time, uh, you know, like the Latin community, uh, the LGBTQ community, queer community, were, were very affected in a special way, but we want to somehow try and erase, uh, you know, while representing it, try and erase that, is, that stigma, you know, um, when people approach the show. So that is something that I thought was interesting to share and, um, and it, it pertains identity and the way in which we relate it to a specific theme for an exhibition. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Uni. Uh, Larry, you wanna share with us uh, final um, thoughts? Well, uh, Talking about language, so I made up a word. I <laughs> made up the word transloca uh, because I wanted to talk about Puerto Rican drag and trans performers who mm. were queer, who were transgender, who were performing in drag. And I just thought that the words that existed, well, they were nice, but I thought that it was even more interesting to make up a word. I, I thought I had made up translocas um, using a very stigmatized term in Spanish, mm. loca and trans, which is a prefix. And then it turns out that a group of feminist scholars working in translation had also made up the word. So, you know, so sometimes many of us make up words. So when there isn't a word that is doing the work that you want, uh, make it up. But what I do want to say is that I, I think it's just really exciting that the Hudson River Museum is putting this event and that it has brought together um, a curator from the Coral Gables Museum, an editor from Arte Publico Press, um, to several of us who work in universities, because I think that this is precise. These are some of the spaces where this very important work is being done in museums, 
in universities, in publishing houses, in newspapers. So the public sphere is precisely the space where we challenge um, things from the past, where we challenge racism, xenophobia, transphobia, uh, misogyny. And language is one of the mm -hmm. tools that we use to change the world. So I think I'm excited to have been able to participate in this conversation. Thank you, and Gabriela. Uh, yeah, I, I would like for um, just to add that you know some of the work that we've been doing at Arte Publico Press. You know, we're we we're a, a, a nonprofit publishing house that has been in the business of publishing the works of U.S. Latinos uh, uh, from the 1980s. Uh, you know, up to contemporary times. Uh, it's a nonprofit press, so please, I invite you all to visit to purchase our books. The more books that we get to sell, the more books that we get to print. We have a we were the first to publish books for children, you know, and, and now we see, you know, children's and young, uh, young adult literature uh, has been booming. Uh, the other uh, part, of, part of the work that we also do is through the work of recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program, which is a program that seeks to recover all the written legacy of Latinos, uh, Hispanics, you know, who, in the, from in the, who participated in the makeup of, of this nation that we now know as, as the United States from the colonial period up until 1980. We have thousands, thousands of materials. You know, we've discovered over 1,400 newspapers that were published in the United States uh, um, in Spanish, in English. In, you know, speaking of language, some were published in Spanish, some were in English, some were uh, trilingually in English, Spanish, and French, in Ladino. And, and a lot of these people were, uh, a lot of the people who were participating uh, were actively um, engaged in, in some of these topics. I mean, unfortunately for me, sometimes it's, it's disheartening to see how writings from the, from the you know, early 1800s, from the mid 1800s are discussing these same issues. Why are people caught, you know, why do have we become strangers in this native land, right? It, it, it is really um, crazy and, 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 and disheartening, like I said, to, to see how some of these mm -hmm. uh, issues that, that you know, began in, in, when the United States be, uh, starts to become a very powerful empire still carry through to the 21st century. So I invite you, we have uh, all of these uh, materials are available uh, to scholars, to community, to the, through the work that we're doing through the Digital Humanities Program. We, want, we train our community uh, into using these archival materials for their for your classes and for for the community itself. So we're very community centered and community driven. So please reach out to us if, if you have any questions. If you want our help, if you want to look at some of these materials, they're for you. That's the work. You know, we've been doing all this work for 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 our community. And yes, thank you, uh, the Hudson River Museum, for this amazing opportunity to reach you all. Thank you so much for these final comments. And I want to go get to the questions and comments. Uh, some of them you can see directly because they're posted on the uh, general chat. Some of them are actually sent uh, to me privately. So I'll, 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 I'll do my best to go over all of them. So the first one from Alan, you, you probably saw already the, uh, the, the question and the comment. So uh, I'm just going to go to that part where he mentions about uh, the, the panelists have, have, have have shared with us the the place of origin, the birth, and everything. So, uh, currently, we all live in the United States, and do you prefer not to use hyphenated terms as Latin American or Latino Americano or Americana uh, uh, as part of your identification, and why? I think Larry mentioned a little bit about this. Uh, whoever wants to jump in to answer this question, I think uh, for the sake of time. I'm going to ask one panelist to 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 answer the question. So whoever wants to answer this one, jump in. Well, uh, oh, Ga Ga Gabriela, go ahead. I just wanted to add really quickly that the Central American community are have, are now also uh, asking, right? Some some there's a movement to use Central American American. Um, so look at the work of Maya Chinchilla for that. Okay, good. I mean, I I think that the hyphen is fascinating. So the Cuban American critic Gustavo Perez Firmat like envisions like this back and forth, like a seesaw, like a two direction. For for some people, the the hyphen is the potential of bringing together. For other people, it is a reminder of the separateness. So so hyphen is a theoretically rich space. Um, some well. Sometimes we are writing these terms without the hyphen. So I have had the experience of having editors 
um, you know, I write Dominican American with the hyphen, the editor removes the hyphen. Um, so, so, so in the written language, in spoken language, in terms of our identities, um, there are a multiplicity of terms. I, I still find it useful to, to describe Juno Diaz as a Dominican American author. Whether there is a hyphen there when I am saying it, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, uh, maybe it, it, it disappears. When I write, I have to make a choice, but as I say, there's mm -hmm. a difference between when you write it and when somebody is editing you. So, so never assume that just because you see, you see it on the page that the person actually chose. Sometimes it is the editor's choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. So I'm gonna read the next question from Erica. Uh, so it's a very interesting uh, panel indeed. And following the idea of educating people, I'm a little puzzled about the use of, uh, of the uh, pronouns. Um, could you help me understand that? I think we went through this, but I, I don't know if somebody wants to just go deeper to this one. Uh, of the use of she, her, ella, or him, he, his, el. So I can I can mention a, a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Um, people are 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 using uh, because uh, if this is in and also in uh, in in um, uh, in compañerismo, right? Being mm -hmm. also in acknowledging that there are communities within within our within the 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 worlds that we live in that do not fit within the binaries that we have used to identify ourselves, right? She or he. And so there is a there is a movement for people to choose to identify what are the pronouns that you want to choose to to be identified with. And so, um, you know, and it, and it allows for anybody who wants to use something aside from he or she to use they, you know, in Spanish, we're using L and we're using, uh, we're using um, I think it's L, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Larry. And so, um, Eje, Eje. Eje, Eje, right. And so, I think it's it's an opportunity to visualize the fact that that um, that there's a fluidity in gender, and that those and it's political. Those the binaries are restrictive, and not everybody not in those those the two binaries that we have uh, do not necessarily fit for everybody. Uh, and I think the more that we visualize it, the easier it will be for us to just to understand that people can call themselves whatever they want, whenever they want, right? I can be ella today and I can be they tomorrow, right? If that's, how it's, if that's the term I choose to use. But I, I would Sorry. add that it, it has to do with the violence of misgendering, of having people use the wrong pronoun for you and how distressing that is because it, it sort of says that you don't look masculine enough or feminine enough so a person is going to impose the pronoun that they think you are. And it's, it's taking a step back and acknowledging when I see a person, I don't necessarily know. Sometimes you do not know if the person self identifies um, as a masculine person, a feminine person or a neutral person. So it is acknowledging that people have the right to tell you what their gender is. Yeah, and I think this uh, probably our panel is not reflective of, of, of the usage of, of the uh, pronoun they, them, but just uh, for Erica, other uh, people also identify as they, them. And so, uh, and that's why we uh, also put it on our signatures and Zoom, just to, as, as Larry was saying, not to assume that this person, even if she has a feminine name, identifies as she, her. Um, also Matthew, and I think it, it comes back to the hyphenated term like Mexican American, but I, I, I think that, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken, but maybe uh, for example, for me, born in Mexico, then Mexican, I don't think I, I'll ever use the term Mexican American. Uh, and, and I make a dis, dis, distinction, I'm Mexican and Mexican American of people of Mexican descent that are born in the United States. Can you talk about this? Is, is this something that is an issue? Uh, Gabriela. Yeah, and, and I and I smile because I'm you know I I, I lived on I, I lived on both sides of the border in Ciudad Juarez yeah. twelve years twelve years in, in El Paso and then I moved to do my masters at the University of New Mexico where then I I moved away from the Mexican Mexican American uh, dichotomy to become a Chicana, right? Mm -hmm. Which as it was it was a huge jump, and mm -hmm. so and and 
you know, and, and the, my process through my, the way that I processed uh, all of this uh, terminology was, you know, when I was living on the border, when you're so in that such a close proximity, I was born in Mexico. And so when, when you're in that close proximity, you continue to call yourself Mexican. And also there's like a, a big push from the community to not Americanize, right? To not, mm -hmm. you know, it, it feels it feels as if that hyphen is pull, pulling you too much onto the American side. But it, it eventually became a very political term for me because, uh, you know, um, we even though we do tend to think that the term Mexican-American refers to people who are born in the United States who are of Mexican descent primarily, uh, just like the term Chicano, um, mm -hmm. many people who are not necessarily, you know, me of Mexican-American heritage also identify uh, uh, as Chicano because these terms become political and you start to identify, I, I understand the fight and the struggles for the, the, some of these communities who choose to, to choose these terms to identify themselves are fighting for, you know, mm -hmm. uh, access to education, representation, uh, language rights. And so I think it's it, in the same thing as Latino, um, once within the United States, we, we're all seen as Latinos, but within our own communities, we start to break apart and then, then we, we become Mexicans or we, we become Mexican Americans. And then when I go to the border, then maybe the community there sees me as a Mexican and not as a Mexican American or as a, or as, or as a hyphenated Mexican American. So I think it's still, uh, I, I, could, I, I, I would, um, I would definitely not uh, define it as, you know, or, or, or yeah, define it as, as someone who lives in the United States. But I think for me, it's more of a political mm -hmm. perspective, right? That, that yes, right now you, maybe you have not lived enough in the United States and maybe not in the, you know, with enough proximity to people who identify as Mexican Americans to understand why those people have chosen that, that term, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna just real, read real quick, and then you can jump in, Uni. Uh, just some comments. Uh, for example, Giselle says, "Great, great discussion, very informative." Uh, also, uh, Ada um, saying that she still finds Neorican an illegal alien, insulting and, and cringeworthy. Right, at this terms. So I think we also mentioned about this. We we comment about this. Um, Melanie, uh, the implementation of vowel e. For gender new, new neutrality, I think we also uh, comment about this, made a comment about this. Uh, but if you want to answer this or just answer one of the other questions, and go ahead, uh, Uni, you wanted to mention something. Uh, hold, there we go. Um, I'll be brief because I was following up on, on Gabriela's question and thinking on on on, on the Cuban condition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it is interesting also with the term Cuban and Cuban American. Um, I feel, and this is not something that I studied deeply, but I feel that Cuban American refers mostly to a second generation, or, or you know, to those Cubans born here. And this comes from the fact that those Cubans that came in the '60s or you know late '50s early 60s they came uh provisionally they thought they were coming back and they were you know those those people that were somehow running away from the revolution and trying to settle here uh they didn't think of it as a permanent uh place to stay and they brought all their you know properties titles they they brought everything with the hope of coming back so they never um thought of themselves as as you know assimilating or 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 the need to find the term to define a hyphen to define who they were they were clearly cubans mm -hmm. as time came you know passed by and they had kids and, and the, the children had children um and the hyphen appears and the, the you know the cuban american term um there's this tendency to relate uh cuban american to those younger generations and mm -hmm. again, this is just um, an interesting. No, definitely great. And I want to mention also something. Uh, another comment that I got uh, is also talking about the border, right? We're talking about Mexicali, Baja California. The, the uh, Erica is is joining us from Mexicali, and she says she's a language teacher trainer, and that's why she wanted to know more about this because she is uh, teaching future generations of, of of teachers. So it's great to hear the perspective and everything. Uh, Larry, you want to say something about oh. the uh, gender neutral? Yeah, so I want to say something about the E. 
but I also just want to say something about the hyphen. Yeah. Um, because some Latinos, Latinas, or Latinxes feel that they are living in the hyphen. Some are living on the hyphen, and some are living off the hyphen. Um, so actually, so different people have written about this, and I think that's one of the exciting things. So I had mentioned Gustavo Perez Firmat, his very interesting, important book, Life on the Hyphen, the Cuban-American Way. Uh, the Mexican um, scholar Ilan Stavans in a grandiose gesture said, Latinos live in the hyphen because they celebrate everything and Juan Flores, who was much more critical and much more aware of the Puerto Rican situation, especially for Puerto Ricans frequently racialized as Black or Afro-diasporic, he said, Puerto Ricans do not live in the hyphen or on the hyphen. We are off the hyphen as colonial yeah. subjects, as people whose countries was invaded yep. by the yeah. United States, as people who have second class citizenship, that is not about being in the hyphen of German American or Italian American or Mexican American. It is about being off the hyphen. And I think that reflects why, mm -hmm. what, as I said, Puerto Ricans typically do not self-identify as Puerto Rican American. It is a very strange linguistic construction. It is very strange to read it in print. Puerto Ricans are Puerto Ricans the same way that a New Yorker is a New Yorker and not a New Yorker American, or the Cherokee or First Nation or indigenous people don't go around hyphenating their tribal name to their American city, US citizenship. The issue of the E in Spanish is fascinating because in Spanish you have the Royal Academy of the Language, La Academia de la Lengua, which, uh, in Spain. Um, which is an organization that tries to control the Spanish language and it does a great service in unifying and generating an extraordinary dictionary. But at the same time, it is very resistant to change, particularly having to do with gender and sexuality. So in Latin America, in places such as Argentina, you have vibrant feminist movements that have been really at the forefront of proposing the use of the vowel E as a way to get beyond the gender binary of O and A. And of course, the Royal Academy of the Language in Spain has resisted. So there are very interesting articles in the newspaper um, and in, in other sources. Um, sometimes in the United States, people try to dismiss the use of the X because they say uh, as a vowel ending uh, in Latin X, for example, because they say that, in, that that doesn't correspond to the Spanish language. Um, it, it would be very hard to say Latin X. It would be very awkward to finish mm -hmm. every single word with a consonant. Uh, but Latin X is, is a word about the United States. I, in Latin America, people are, are also using the X. They're using the E. It is incorrect, I'm going to say ignorant, not to recognize that in Latin America, in the Spanish language, people are having the same struggles about gender inclusivity and about challenging homophobia and transphobia and lesbophobia than we are in the United States. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And for the sake of time, I know there, this is a very uh, extensive topic that we can just spend hours and hours talking and discussing. Uh, thank you so much to each of the panelists for such a lively conversation and for sharing your, your personal experience. I hope that uh, also our viewers can uh, go back to the different communities and continue this conversation. And I'm going to hand it over to Masha. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jose, and uh, thank you to all of the panelists. I, I genuinely mean this when I say we could stay in this room and talk about this for many more hours. This is fascinating. Uh, and I also want to say I really appreciate having all of you and your different perspectives and also having another museum perspective, because as it, what I really appreciate, for example, Larry, that you said was, um, you know, that, that, that it's important to even to, to ask someone, well, how would you prefer to be referred to? And the challenge I think institutionally is that we don't have that opportunity to reach out to every, let's say, member or of the public when we make 
a description of a program, for example. So it is, it's a bit fraught because we really are very intent on being respectful and, and up with the times. I remember, I recall reading that the Pew Research Center had, had published a study, I want to say maybe last August, that, that actually really highlighted that a younger generation was using uh, the, the, the X, whereas their parents were not. And that they're even within families, there is not necessarily agreements. And so, for example, members of the public who come to the museum from within the same family unit may not embrace the same term, right? So anyway, I would love that. I feel like we, it would be great to have a follow up to this whole panel. <laughs> so, but I, I wanted to say thank you because this is an incredibly rich topic. Um, it's one that is of great interest to me. Um, I wanted to bring to everyone's attention some upcoming programs that I think are a great jumping off point. Um, and what I will do at the same time as I talk about them is drop them into the chat. Uh, what's coming up is a really interesting conversation with um, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Smith Ramos uh, and, and um, Enrique Perret, and they are, the panel will be called Bridging the Wall. Um, Ken and Enrique are going to be talking about the economic, sociological, and political factors that actually drive immigration. And, um, and how to continue efforts to provide dialogue and cooperation between the two, uh, the two countries. So very excited about that. In a moment, I will be putting in the, the, uh, the information in the chat. That will be Saturday, March 13th. Um, in addition, I'm so excited to, to report to everyone that uh, Guillermo Galindo, who is one half of the exhibition, Border Contos, Sonic Border, will be, uh, will be performing for us. He's an experimental composer who fabricates musical instruments that are objects that were found along the border. Um, and he, he creates these incredible compositions. Uh, so that will be on Saturday, March 20th. And for now, finally, I will also let everyone know, uh, I, I think that everyone on this call, will be very, uh, this, this chat will be very interested in, um, we have an outstanding author uh, who will be speaking with us at the museum, Valeria Luiselli, will be coming to discuss um, Niños Perdidos, or Tell Me How It Ends, and talking about migration stories uh, that were featured in her book. So we have a lot of fantastic programming coming up. I'm going to actually take a moment to put those in the chat before we end here. So I want to say on behalf of the Hudson River Museum, thank you for sharing your expertise with us and your perspectives. Uh, they, they further inform how we, well, how we think about programs. And Jose, to your point, it is so important that the museum be a space where we can talk about this and advance these conversations. And I love that I even learned a new word today, like translocas. That is just fantastic. <laughs> and I, I would like to be talking to you about some programming. <laughs> so uh, to, to all of you, my thanks. Uh, and I will be putting this in the chat right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.